Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and wake welcome to this uh, the side event today at the UN side event. Um, we have uh, quite a very um, interesting lineup of uh, colleagues for around the UN system. And but first of all, I would like to thank uh, very much uh, Hindu and uh, IAPFCC for uh, helping us to um, have this space here for us to discuss. Um, just for those of you who need um, interpretation, there are um, headsets um, at the <coughs> corner there. Uh, so maybe what um, I'd like to do is just to set into context a little bit. As we all know, one the key conversation for us here at COP23 is this operalization, operas, I still can't pronounce it, opera <laughs> operationalization of the local communities and indigenous peoples platform as a way to kind of promote, to catalyze the knowledge of indigenous peoples within decision making um, here at the UNFCC and at climate change policies in general. Now, this key conversation, of course, is just, isn't just here at the UNFCCC, but it's been going on um, across at the international level at least for at least 25 years. How do we bring the knowledge and the voices of indigenous peoples into this space? And most notably, for many of us who are at the here, we know very well this has been very prominent in discussions on biodiversity at the international level. And so we thought that it might be interesting for um, uh, the UN bodies here to see the different ways, to show you the different ways that um, how knowledge has been contributing uh, towards the SDGs and how has uh, different UN uh, systems um, try to take this into account. So today what we wanna do is we're gonna hear some short interventions um, on the opportunities, achievements, and experiences um, by which knowledge is brought and IPs are our feature in the work of these different UN bodies. And then after that, perhaps we can have discussions on what works, what can work better, and what can inform the discussions here at the UNFCCC. Um, so that, uh, so with that, maybe I'd uh, give uh, the floor over to um, Hindu. Thank you very much, Jen. Uh, and uh, sorry again for those of you who are here all the day, maybe you really hear a lot <laughs> from Hindu. So I'm very happy to co-moderate this uh, site event and then in this Indigenous People Day, who is very uh, special for us historically, is the first time that UNFCCC dedicate the Indigenous People's Day. So uh, as Jen say, I have the honor and the pleasure to introduce the first speaker, who, who is uh, Mr. Douglas Nakashima from the UNESCO. Douglas worked more than 30 years on uh, indigenous people's knowledge divisions as director uh, at the UNESCO. So he helped to put a lot like the project that I talked about it in the previous uh, panel. So he helped a lot to implement this project and then he's helping across all the world to, to indigenous people's traditional knowledge to be recognized. So uh, Mr. Douglas Nakashima is now a director and interim of the science policy and the capacity building. So we'll be happy to hear uh, from him. Douglas, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Hindu, and thank you, uh, Jennifer, the co-moderators, uh, for this uh, very interesting panel. I'll go very quickly. I'd just like to uh, introduce some of the work that UNESCO has been doing over the last uh, more than 10 years. In fact, 15 years, the uh, local and indigenous knowledge uh, program exists uh, at UNESCO, looking specifically at indigenous knowledge, local knowledge, uh, with respect to environmental governance. So if we can get the next slide. I think I have to, or do I have to do something to get the next slide? Do I control it here? Or do I? Yeah, yeah. we have this one control. Ah. Yeah, I wasn't sure if I had control. Okay, well, something seems to be working. Uh, so let's just keep going along and maybe we'll make it. Um, as uh, Jennifer was mentioning, uh, the important discussions here at COP23 relate to 
uh, operationalizing a platform for local communities and indigenous peoples. And I think the idea, the thinking behind that that every, everyone agrees on is that what's important is to have the best available knowledge uh, for climate change decision making. And that best avail no available knowledge, of course, comes from scientific knowledge, but also comes uh, a great deal from local communities and indigenous people. So how to bring together these uh, two knowledge sets in order to, to provide decision makers with the best uh, knowledge available for the t decision that they have to take in relation to climate change. Next slide. Or maybe it's me, ah, good. Okay, so just quickly then to uh, illustrate a few of the modalities that UNESCO has been implementing with indigenous peoples over the past years in order to experiment, pilot uh, different ways to uh, facilitate this interaction between scientific knowledge and indigenous knowledge. Right, okay. And um, uh, at different scales and uh, in for different purposes. Uh, just to say that it's not obvious. In fact, there's quite challenging to bring together these different knowledge systems, which are anchored in very different cosmologies, worldviews, uh, very basic assumptions are very different from the starting point. So it's quite a challenge, in fact, the how-to part of the work of bringing together indigenous knowledge and scientific knowledge. UNESCO has been delivering global conferences in order mainly for building awareness uh, and sharing interregionally lessons learned on indigenous knowledge and practices. It's also been uh, delivering uh, reviews of the scientific and gray literature on indigenous knowledge for, for example, uh, the uh, ongoing uh, climate change assessments. Uh, they've all, we've also worked in, uh, at a more national scale and subnational scale with dialogue workshops, which bring t people together face to face, and then also transdisciplinary observatories. And I'll give you some examples very quickly of some of this work that's ongoing. <coughs> So this is just to illustrate uh, the glo global conferences that UNESCO has been organizing on indigenous peoples, indigenous knowledge, and climate change. One uh, just, just prior to, uh, in Paris, to COP21, another at COP22 in Mar Marrakesh, and then just two weeks ago, uh, we organized the third uh, global conference uh, in the run-up to COP23 to provide inputs into these processes and discussions about indigenous knowledge. Another example uh, of um, the expert review process uh, in the framework of the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and their preparation of the fifth assessment report, um, an expert review of indigenous knowledge in the scientific and gray literature was compiled. Um, the publication Weathering Uncertainty, this is just the summary from that publication, but the idea being to facilitate for the authors of, scientific authors of the assessment to introduce them to key concepts in relation to indigenous knowledge and make that, make indigenous knowledge that has been documented in the scientific gray literature accessible for authors. Um, also, uh, a dialogue workshop was organized in Mexico in 2011 between the, the ch chair of the working group two of IPCC and several authors so that there's a face-to-face -face encounter between indigenous peoples, indigenous knowledge holders, and uh, the authors of the IPCC assessment. And I think this led to some positive outcomes uh, for the fifth assessment report. And now we will hear more uh, shortly from uh, Yuba Sagona about ongoing work for the sixth assessment report. Uh, the dialogue workshops, as I mentioned, are really to allow for this face-to-face -face dialogue, which is essential in order for to come to a common understanding of objectives and a common and mutually, uh, say, mutual respect and recognition of each other's knowledge systems. I think this cost cross-cultural insights are important to establish an understanding that provides a basis for moving forward together towards a joint project. There have also been uh, community-based observatories that we're piloting in two uh, <coughs> uh, regions that are particularly vulnerable to um, uh, climate change impacts, one in Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. We're working in six countries in Sub-Saharan Africa with different pastoral peoples and bridging between the uh, National Meteorological Bureau and also pastoral peoples to pool their knowledge and observations about climate change impacts uh, in order to contribute to climate change decision making. Another work, another network has been established also uh, in the uh, circumpolar Arctic, uh, here focusing in particular on uh, reindeer herding uh, pastoralists from uh, Sweden, 
uh, also Evan uh, from the Sami from Sweden and Evan from uh, Russia, uh, interacting also with uh, uh, Inuit from across Alaska, Canada, and Greenland in order to pool their observations of how the climate is impacting on, impacting on the environments, their livelihoods, and how uh, crossing uh, indigenous knowledge and scientific knowledge can bring solutions to some of the challenges that they're facing. So, uh, coming to a conclusion, the local communities and indigenous peoples platform can be useful to jointly identify solutions. I think this is uh, what we have been at UNESCO working with indigenous peoples to explore uh, possibilities for finding solutions through joint work. But of course, there's a number of challenges. Uh, the ch challenges relate to bridging scales because scientific uh, uh, technologies which are uh, very uh, useful and improving all the time, remote sensing, using ocean temperature monitoring, uh, using seasonal uh, outlook forecasts, these are extremely valuable tools but they're working at a much, much larger scale and many of the indigenous peoples that we're working with find that those larger scale information are of interest but not vital at this point to, for their local decision making as they need, as they, they specifically need themselves. Finally, there is also the bridging between the quantitative data from science with the more qualitative observations that are coming from indigenous communities and also indigenous communities are looking at a wide range of variables for their climate decision making uh, whereas uh, scientific data tends to focus on, focus in depth on a relatively limited number of variables. And there's also a question of what it is that you're measuring and monitoring. And uh, I think that there again, there can be benefits for bridging between uh, what uh, indigenous peoples are monitoring in the communities and what scientists are monitoring. Uh, because those indicators that are being used are very different in many cases, but may be very complementary. So, to conclude, I just wanted to mention that uh, there are opportunities in particular for co-producing knowledge uh, through a process of dialogue where, in fact, uh, if there is mutual respect uh, between the scientific community on the one hand and indigenous knowledge holders on the other, there can be uh, possibilities for uh, bridging between very different approaches, worldviews, and epistemologies, a joint formulation of research questions, collaborative methods for data collection, and flexible arrangements for interaction between the group, two groups. And I think this can lead to uh, the comp new knowledge, co-produced knowledge, that can provide uh, answers to some of the challenging and complex issues that are uh, in front of us due to climate change. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Douglas, for your uh, presentation. Um, right now, I'd like to um, introduce um, the next speaker, um, um, Felipe Lucio, who's the director of the Global F uh, Framework for Climate Services at the World uh, Meteorological Organization. And we're at uh, the Links program, we're very fortunate to have very two key partners that help us bring together both uh, the meteorological aspect and, of course, that's uh, very much WMO. And um, as well, at, uh, in the policy sense, we also work very closely with the uh, National Adaptation uh, Program, and, at and that links us to a lot of the adaptation work and adaptation policy making at the national level. Uh, so the GFCS uh, provides, in my view, a very interesting entry point at the national levels for, for um, working um, with the uh, science policy interface. And I'll just uh, stop there and let uh, uh, Mr. Lucio te tell us more about it. Well, thank you very much for inviting us to be on this panel. I'd like to start this uh, very short intervention by introducing the Global Framework for Climate Services. For those of you who do not know what the Global Framework for Climate Services, it's a global initiative established at the Third World Climate Conference in 2009 in Geneva. And for those who don't have white hair like I do, the two previous um, World Climate Conferences were very important because the first gave rise to the IPCC, the second gave rise to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and a couple of very specific uh, programs, and the third gave rise to the Global Framework for Climate Services, 
with the objective of enhancing the production, availability and application of climate services in support of decision making in climate uh, sensitive sectors. So as a way of demonstrating the real contribution that climate services could bring to decision making, and I'm picking from what Douglas just said, um, we've always heard that uh, decision making using climate has not been very effective because uh, of the quality of the information being provided. The quality in the sense that um, uh, traditionally there's a perception that the information provided is too coarse and therefore does not uh, really support uh, decision making at a community and local level. So we had a project uh, supported by um, uh, uh, Norway in which we spent uh, $10 million in Tanzania and Malawi to provide climate services in support of uh, agriculture and food security, health and disaster risk reduction. And as part of that uh, initiative, and that's where the link with the, the current uh, um, topic we are discussing is, we had a specific um, activity related to the assessment of communities in terms of um, their satisfaction in using um, climate services. And um, in that particular element, we had uh, research on use of indigenous knowledge by local communities and methodologies of um, uh, trying to integrate indigenous knowledge with uh, uh, contemporary and scientific uh, knowledge. First of all, uh, one of the, the, the main elements we um, um, uh, learned from this project is the fact that um, communities are really interested in accessing information. Um, they're interested in accessing information. They have been using in information, particularly uh, 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 indigenous knowledge, but they still need uh, support in um, using contemporary information. In Tanzania and Malawi, we started um, a number of activities which enable communities to access uh, email, uh, excuse me, um, uh, information through SMS uh, messaging uh, uh, services. We have um, um, radio services which um, uh, provide uh, uh, information to communities. Communities have established uh, what they call listening clubs through which they um, gather together, listen to a particular climate information, and then they uh, uh, communicate that information to different um, users. They've also um, created through um, um, the use of volunteers of the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Society, who is part of the implementation of project. Uh, specific uh, uh, um, uh, intermediaries um, in the sense of uh, extension officers who access climate information and then go on to communicate the information to, to different users. One particular element here, and uh, going back to the issue that uh, was um, raised by, by Douglas, the type of information that's provided in those countries is information downscaled at district level. This was uh, something introduced for the first time in Tanzania and Malawi because in the past, the type of information provided by the meteorological services was of very uh, 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 coarse nature and therefore many people um, um, did not take action because they did not relate to the information which was being provided. So going back to the assessments, when Farmers, when users were asked at which type of information they prefer to use, scientific information or traditional knowledge, uh, the vast majority indicated that even though they received um, climate information, contemporary climate information, they still relied on um, uh, the use of traditional knowledge. At that point, um, we had to unpack that uh, answer and try to identify and understand why is it that if there is scientific knowledge, people still rely on traditional knowledge. And the answers to that were firstly, um, the current climate information provided is not provided in a way that uh, promotes effective use by, um, by, by farmers. Farmers need to understand better the information, need the information to be provided in a format and language they can understand but also the communication flows that are used are probably not the most uh, effective. I talked about SMS uh, services, I talked about uh, radio services, but beyond the communication of information, they need a trusted 
um, um, individual who could convey that. So it's not very often a matter of what is being communicated, but it's a matter of uh, who's, being, who's communicating what. And so we still have uh, research ongoing in Malawi with the involvement of uh, the Lilongwe University of Agriculture and Natural Resources and CMI from Norway. And um, in Tanzania, involving uh, uh, the Dar es Salaam University and Cicero, trying to unpack the reasons why we have today, uh, after providing more detailed uh, predictions and eventually more accurate uh, predictions, uh, the communities, uh, the farmers, would still rely on um, traditional knowledge. Um, to conclude, a key, a few key things we came out from, um, uh, come out with from this experience, was one what um, um, Douglas indicated: the need of um, co-producing climate information, and to the extent possible. Intr including integrating traditional uh, uh, knowledge in the information that is uh, communicated. Because very often when communities are confronted with a case where the contemporary information contradicts the traditional uh, knowledge they have or the traditional knowledge contradicts the uh, contemporary information that is being broadcast, we will find ourselves in a, in, in a situation where perhaps it's going to be difficult for them to, to make a decision. But if these processes are, 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 are dealt with together, if they're part of the same process of generating information, perhaps then they'll be uh, in a better position to make the best use of information and not have to choose um, different types of information. So co-production, co-development is an element which is uh, very critical. The second lesson we learned from this um, experience is um, the need of developing effective mechanism for communicating information. Just having information by itself is not enough. We need to find the, the right ways, the trustworthy ways that uh, uh, would uh, 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 give confidence to users, would give confidence to, to farmers about the type of information that they're getting. This is not to say that uh, we need to overblow the quality of information, no. But the information has to be communicated the best way possible, and as I said, by using the me best means and channels possible. Uh, thirdly, it's also very important the way different groups in society perceive um, uh, information. In the uh, research which is still ongoing, we had uh, uh, assessments of the perception of information from women and, uh, and men. And depending on where you are, the type of um, uh, the, the perceptions you get are slightly different. We are hoping to be able to produce a book um, early next year in which uh, details about that uh, research and um, 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 uh, the ongoing work is going to be made available. And I'd like to invite you to um, um, read uh, that uh, particular publication, which promises to be a very interesting reading. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Felipe, and thank you all really to uh, share with us this idea. We know that uh, uh, assessment in the community and using on all diverse services are very important, and uh, specifically you mentioned the language that the uh, community need to understand the knowledge exchange are very important. Then uh, also like uh, the tools that you are sharing the knowledge is one thing, but having confidence and trust that really can best the sustainability of knowledge sharing. Thank you very much. So uh, I have the honor and pleasure to introduce uh, uh, my, uh, my cousin, uncle here, uh, Yuba Sokona, who is uh, a bureau member of the IPCC, who is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, who work a lot and know also on indigenous peoples and uh, science knowledge. So Mr. Yuba, you have the floor. Okay, thank you, <coughs> and thank you also for the organizer to give me again the opportunity to take part to that conversation, and I hope that it will be a conversation because uh, this is the issue is obvious. I, I, I think maybe we need to reflect a bit on uh, the, uh, the use of traditional knowledge or initial knowledge. It's a knowledge. 
and then there's different form expressing the knowledge and then uh, with that uh, and then I think that this is very important it's not part of knowledge is secondary and then second part works uh, and to come to the importance of that all kind of knowledge was recognized by IPCC in the assessment to go for better understanding the scientific, the technical, socioeconomic understanding of the climate, you need to uh, all kind of knowledge that is important. But however, there is a number of constant limitation in the IPCC process because IPCC is not providing producing knowledge, it's assessing existing knowledge. And then the assessment takes different form. It, it based on uh, predominantly the peer, liter peer review literature, but it's not the only one. Many people say, thought that the gray literature, it cannot be assessed in the IPCC. Just go to the website and then look at the website, all the uh, assessment criteria that that gray literature can be assessed in the IPCC. And then do, those forms of knowledge, and then you find them more frequently in the gray literature. And then you find them also in a literature that's not great literature, that's not peer review literature, that is uh, oral forms, and that make it a bit difficult. And then to bring them, and then to take in consideration for the understanding, because they inform perfectly the uh, scientific understanding of the climate change aspect. And then they inform also some of the technical and economic and social aspect uh, of, the, of the climate and how to capture uh, that form and then that particular form of knowledge and then we cannot neglect as uh, if you look at the different IPCC assessments and then we try from the global to come more on the regional aspect. And then this is where it became much more important in particularly in many developing countries. And then it's uh, in partnership with a number of organizations, UNESCO and United Nations University, and then we organize a number of workshops uh, and expert meetings as IPC is not producing knowledge. And then we did it with UNESCO and uh, United Nations University, and uh, Douglas always already mentioned on the uh, working group two perspective, that is vulnerability, adaptation, and the risks uh, that was held in Mexico with uh, the United Nations University. And then the mitigation, we had it in Cairns, working group three perspective, and then uh, with also national, uh, uh, United Nations University. And then the, 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 the uh, expert meeting was attended by researchers and indigenous people. They came in from all over the world. It's not the mixture, and then someone uh, indicated the co-producing of knowledge. It to capture that, and then that has been synthesized in a number of documents, and then that feed the uh, third, uh, as the fifth assessment report of IPCC. Now we are moving toward the sixth assessment report of IPCC because the the knowledge and then the wealth of information and uh, on that part is much more related to the solution part rather than on the explaining the issue, understanding the issue. Because if you go to any places in the world and then you find that the, those form of knowledge is used to cope with climate variability. And then that's very important. And then all the different aspects related to that coping is adequate and variability is adequate for, to a certain extent, to the climate change. And we are coming also in a context where, uh, in the context of Paris Agreement, the prominence is, do, is, do, is uh, given to the bottom of approach, that the national approach. And at the same time, there is no way you can implement the sustainable development uh, goals in a top-down approach, it's a bottom-up. All of them are coming from the national, and then most of the national uh, strategic perspective should integrate those parts. And I think that there is a need of educating policymakers 
and then different stakeholders at national level to have a better use of them. I challenge anyone, at least in the case of Africa, anyone who are only using the modern medicine. We are all both using the two medicines. Because we are not to rely on any of them. We said that, okay, we rely on the, uh, uh, what we call traditional medicine, but we use the modern one. And at the same time, we said that we are skeptical. And then those are the two different elements. And I think that we need to bring those two together. And then to provide, because the, uh, the, 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 the real issue, it is not the recognition of the importance of it, how it will be a part of the vehicle for the solutions. Within the IPCC, we used to say that we are a map makers. And the policy makers are a navigators. If you want to navigate, you need a map. And then the more detailed the map is, the more easier you will be able to navigate. And then to make the map, you cannot rely only on one aspect, on one perspective. And then you have to broaden the whole different perspective. And those are some of the elements I just wanted to uh, flag in the discussion in order to have a conversation and to see how we will orient that toward the solutions rather than highlighting the importance of the issue. It's very important. Thank you. Uh, thank you. you uh, as usual, you, he was, uh, you are very inspiring. I, I like very much this, the, this uh, image now I have of um, assessments and knowledge assessments being the map makers and policies being the navigators and, and knowing that the, the more detailed and more inputs that we have into this map, the better the direction can be. Um, but uh, you, he did uh, bring up uh, one interesting point on the term on on assessments, and if assessments are to feed into policy, how do we then get the <coughs> best knowledge on the table? Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more in the biodiversity context at the end, because we also have uh, um, IPBES uh, the uh, a bit later. But first of all, we I would like to it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Jason Spensley, who is a senior specialist um, from the Green Climate Fund. Um, in charge of uh, project preparation and adaptation planning. Um, and it's been a very interesting process at the GCF because they are now um, in the process, I understand, of uh, uh, having an indigenous people's policy and I'd like him to invite him to share some experiences with that. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to, to be speaking with you uh, here today. If you allow me just for a very brief moment to share a little bit of a personal anecdote in a very uh, different stage of life uh, before I found myself inside events at conferences of the parties. I lived in an isolated indigenous community. I lived and raised beautiful local children in, 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 in an isolated Inuit community on, on the shore of the Hudson Bay in the Canadian Arctic where traditional practices aren't, aren't a theory. They're the main way of life and, and where the impacts of climate change are felt every day in virtually every aspect of life in a very real way. And, and this is what motivated me to come to side events and conferences of the parties and, 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 and eventually to work with the Green Climate Fund. And, and I can share, to you, share with you very sincerely that there is a keen awareness and a priority placed inside the fund on the crucial or fundamental importance that indigenous peoples play on the front lines <coughs> Uh, in the fight uh, against climate change uh, because of, thank you, because of um, uh, traditional knowledge, because of sustainable uh, resource management practices, uh, because of uh, abilities to address climate change, uh, technologies to address climate change, uh, changing climate and sustainable uh, resource management that have been practiced for millennia. Um, at the same time, there is recognition that indigenous peoples are among the most affected by the reality of a changing climate. Um, because of their close relationship with the land, with the water, with ecosystems and ecosystem services, and I'm privileged to be sitting next to a 
a colleague from 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 IP Bess. Um, and uh, numerous studies ha have documented very clearly that often, very often, uh, land forests that are managed by indigenous people store carbon more effectively, uh, degrade forests uh, less, um, and, and very often uh, yeah, traditional technologies for adapting to climate change can be among the most effective, efficient, um, and impactful. Uh, that we have at our disposal. So it's with this context that the, um, that the, the Green Climate Fund is creating an Indigenous Peoples Policy. It was uh, mandated by the, the 15th meeting of the board to the Green Climate Fund a little over a year ago now. Um, the, the, the purpose of the policy is, or the goal, is, is really to be international best practice, truly to be state of the art. Um, for a couple of, um, a, a couple of, uh, a couple of reasons. First, to ensure that uh, resources of the Green Climate Fund can be used for um, and by indigenous peoples. Uh, also to ensure that uh, resources uh, benefit uh, indigenous, uh, of the Green Climate Fund benefit indigenous peoples in a culturally appropriate manner. Um, the, 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 the policy has been actively developed over the, the past year or so since the 15th meeting of the board. It's gone through uh, uh, two very extensive uh, round of, uh, of, of comments um, involving 60 different submissions um, which have involved um, themselves over 180 Indigenous Peoples organizations as well as a number of other or organizations naturally. Um, uh, the policy is now at the stage of undergoing a, a further review of the, of the board itself as well as um, active observers. Um, next steps include um, uh, finalizing the policy uh, naturally as well as developing a, an accompanying uh, uh, guidance materials for, for use of the policy. And, and then deploying it and in, in including with a number of uh, technical uh, workshops and, and, and clinics over the next uh, months and, and years. Um, uh, I'll pause there. Uh, thank you very much again for the opportunity. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation, uh, uh, Jason. And then uh, we are very happy that GCF is uh, uh, preparing the Indigenous Peoples uh, Policy. And then, uh, I mean, now uh, we are looking forward for this discussion. We, are, we were like expecting to have that in, uh, uh, in the last meeting in uh, Egypt and then here. Yeah, like it's, uh, wow, no, no, sorry, he's not going to come up is coming up soon. So uh, I'll allow you just uh, to call on uh, Miss uh, Sekihil from the CBD. Koketsa, yes. Please, if you can just uh, join us here and then you can sit and uh, maybe f be familiar a little bit with the light. And by this time, I leave my colleague Jennifer to introduce the IPBS. So there is a seat just uh, next to John's, uh, Jason, there. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Hindu. Um, it's uh, now my very good pleasure to um, introduce the next speaker, who is uh, Thomas Scoots. Uh, he's from the Intergovernmental uh, Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Uh, he, had, he heads the work program, and we're very fortunate in the Lynx program to also uh, be part of that extended uh, secretariat uh, as the technical support unit for indigenous and local knowledge systems. So um, take it away, Thomas. Thank you very much, Jen. Um, so, and thank you very much for providing that opportunity also to, to IPBIS um, to present its work on, um, on indigenous and local knowledge, um, which I think we have made some interesting progress over the last years. Um, to give a little bit of an introduction, um, IPBIS is, in, 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 in a very short form, um, very similar, or the brother of IPCC. It's, it's an intergovernmental panel, a platform, 
working um, mainly on assessments, but also on th three other functions, namely capacity building, um, knowledge mobilization, and the catalysis of um, knowledge generation, uh, research, and on providing for policy support. Um, I did have a slide somewhere. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so part of our, so IPIS was established in 2012 uh, formally, and we started our work program only um, in 2014. And um, part of its operating principles um, from the very beginning have been to um, include and to recognize and respect and work with indigenous um, and local communities in order to um, involve that knowledge. Um, so we've been um, very early on have been given at our hands um, the technical support unit on, on indigenous and local community um, knowledge in the form of the team around Douglas Nakashima and Jennifer. Um, and since the very first years of our work program, we have worked with a expert group and a task force on um, finding out what way and, and in what way we can bring in and work with um, indigenous and local knowledge. And similar to um, points that my, um, my neighbor on the IPCC has made, um, there are numerous challenges doing that. So it took us a little bit time to orient ourselves and what we are going, you know, how to do this. We made some really valuable experiences in trying out various um, things and we appreciated and, um, and benefited from um, Douglas and, and Jennifer's support there a lot and experience in other venues. Coming to the approach itself. So this approach was then um, tabled to the plenary after a couple of years um, discussion. It was tabled to the plenary at the last plenary. So it's um, now approved in March 2017. So fairly young and we're now in the, <coughs> in the, in the phase of establishing it. Um, here I'm given a, a short overview of um, the basically the, the basic elements um, of this approach. Um, the approach with working for ILK and IPIS is, is multifaceted, and I explained a little why. It's, it cuts across the four functions of IPIS, which is, of, you know, first and foremost, it's anchored in the assessment work, um, which is the synthesis of existing um, uh, knowledge and um, bringing together according to certain questions. But it also involves our work on capacity building and policy support and knowledge mobilization and knowledge generation. Um, it considers various scales from global to local, but please have in mind, I mean, just like IPCC, we are a very small entity based at the local, at the, sorry, at the global level in the sense of our radius of activities is global while our reach in terms of scrutiny or you know, in, in, in investigation or you know, bringing synthesis going all the way down to the local level, but that brings a lot of challenges um, with it when you get to the question of how to mobilize the local knowledge um, and bring it up to a level where um, IPIS um, or assessment processes can take it up. Um, the other part is also, um, the, you know, we have to involve activities which are both undertaken within our activities of, let's say, the, the core activities of, of IPIS, of what we are being funded and, and mandated to do, but we're very much also reliant to use our partners and other institutions which work on these issues to collaborate with this and to cascade basically down from the, the, the global level of activities for the assessments to the local level and back up again to bring that bottom up approach of mobilizing that knowledge, making that available to the assessment processes, for example. Um, the, it is so if by nature, therefore, sort of based, the approach based on, on an internal effort um, and an external effort. Um, the approach also has been taken a lot of consideration into account. Um, one is the scale approach or the scale challenge. The other um, issues are challenges around representation and presentation. I mean, who, um, what, who is allowed or who is the best person to represent indigenous knowledge in these, in these, um, in this uh, fora or expert groups, etc. And we have made a lot of effort to bring um, us ourselves into um, you know, the, the knowledge of what are the best practices out there in terms of um, free and 
um, prior informed consent and all other sort of latest state of the art <coughs> standards um, with regard to interaction with, with um, IPLCs. Um, the, the overall approach then, um, and this is now getting a bit more pragmatic, um, is based first and foremost on our activities around the assessments. And there we have distinguished four phases. We have a first phase where, which is the, the, um, the scoping phase where assessments are scoped. And there the emphasis is that we are um, trying to, um, in a collaborative way, define the, the problems and the goals of what an assessment which is then to be launched is supposed to look at. And there's an emphasis, uh, emphasis made that um, um, we reach out to the um, IPLCs through um, one, having experts on ILK on the smaller expert groups uh, actually drafting that scope, but also through a process such as the dialogue workshops mentioned um, and other process to help us to um, define the key questions um, of this assessment, in particular, you know, informed by, by what is the key issues at stake for IPLCs. The second phase then is once there's been agreement by, by governments to launch that assessment, to bring together a wide area of evidence and data from really multiple sources of, um, of knowledge, including, of course, scientific knowledge, and that includes scientific knowledge on, on ILK or ILK-relevant scientific publications, but it does go um, by definition, and that's um, where we have learned also from the IPCC upfront a lot further into including um, recorded and oral um, uh, knowledge types which are in principle allowed um, to bring on board. It needs to be, uh, and that is the key point, it needs to be referenceable. I mean, all of our knowledge needs to have a, a publicly available reference um, so it can be treated as any other type of knowledge which is brought to the table. Um, the, so that's the second phase in the beginning of, of bringing this all together. The third phase then focuses on engaging indigenous peoples and local communities in the review of the various um, you know, reviews of the assessment reports. We have, just like the IPCC, um, two peer review phases. Um, a first draft, um, a first order draft is reviewed within a, a year's time of, of the assessment, and then in the second year we have a second order draft review, um, and including also a review of the summary for policymakers and then the final review. During the first reviews, we make an emphasis or an, or an effort to reach out to um, IPLCs and the communities um, to have a specific look at the, the, the various drafts um, with a focus on the questions related to I, IPLCs and indigenous local knowledge and really try to do that um, by various means and I come to that in a moment. And then fast, uh, the last one, the phase four, um, is, is then when once that assessment has been agreed and approved um, by uh, the government, by the plenary, then we go in a, in a phase which um, is, is, you know, the working title was giving back. Basically the whole idea is that, okay, now we have that um, knowledge all in, in one place and now it's time to really give back what we, you know, and, and share with the IPLCs and the knowledge and the information we have gained and brought together and co-produced co in some form with them. And, and so there's an emphasis there on, on, on um, sort of ramping up capacity building activities and, and outreach um, and to bring that knowledge back into the um, local communities. Um, this is sort of the four phases of the assessment process and you can see that across the four phases um, you can and we will um, engage capacity building activities, activities around mobilizing knowledge um, to make it available um, to the processes of IPBIS um, and of policy support um, which is uh, the function there is to, to provide access to um, sort of mechanisms and tools which are relevant for um, policy support. Um, one last, uh, second last slide. Um, the important procedural components. Um, one is, of course, having a appropriate uh, representation of ILK experts in the experts groups. We have, um, we've uh, had, um, I think the practice has shown it is that um, 
while they can be ILK and should be to the extent possible ILK holders or you know genuine ILK indigenous people or really local um, community leaders, they do need to have some form of experience in working in an expertise slash scientific um, environment because that's um, still what the main game of this of this organization is. Um, so that would be the first part to really be part of the inside of these groups to steer that and we have reached in the global assessment a very good um, balance there and that has shown to be proven really, really effective. The other part is um, the other mechanism by which we try to work and it's of course limited by nature is a web-based consultation. So we try through, our, um, through an interactive uh, consultation to um, reach out as far as possible to gain and to be bringing on board as much as possible in material, in all sorts of form, um, referenceable, of course, um, to the, 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 the IPIS. Um, this is also used in when it comes to, um, to, the, to the reviews. Um, we have then the dialogue workshops, which is basically what, what Douglas in the beginning referred to, the dialogue workshops in the context of, of uh, IPCC, where we have face-to-face -face meetings. There's one, for example, now um, scheduled in December when it comes to the SUBSTA, which is the scientific um, body to the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, um, which is also the, the meeting then of the Article AJ, which deals with traditional knowledge. And there's a whole de day dedicated to um, uh, working with and going th with the um, IPLC representative through our latest um, draft uh, uh, of the of the global assessment and to verify with them whether we are on the right track and whether there are other things that need to be addressed. Then there in the synthesis phase, um, we, we also we continue to work with the internal um, group on, on indigenous, etc. And very much, and this is where I'm also happy to meet new colleagues here um, I haven't met before, which are really engaged in supporting work on, on IPLCs and indigenous knowledge, we really are fundamentally um, reliant on work of other organizations and institutions that actually do undertake the efforts in mobilizing knowledge and bringing these together and reaching out to the communities to have that effect of um, bringing that from bottom up to the global level, which we as a very small institution would not ever be able to do ourselves. Um, very quick, further institutional arrangements. There's, of course, our internal shop. That's the first list of things of, in, you know, our expert group. The liaison groups is so just the ILK um, experts within the expert groups. The task force on ILK um, and the secretariat. But very importantly, and this is the this is the, the another decision which has been made just recently by the bureau, which given the mandate by the plenary just also in, in March. We are now establishing um, the participatory mechanism for working with ILK, which is one of the main vehicles to, to make this work, um, which um, includes various elements. Um, and it, has a, it is hosting and um, overseeing and the web-based platform, and it has dedicated consultations and strategic partnerships. The way it's structured um, is, is here, and this has been now um, agreed by the Bureau, so we'll soon, within the next uh, month, go ahead and, and try to establish this and call for various parts. The green part, if you see that, is sort of the, the inside of the IPBIS machinery with its expert groups and uh, advisory panels, etc. The red element is um, the IPLCs, and um, you know all the IPLCs which, um, within um, other fora, are represented through their seven regions. And the blue part here is, is trying to represent all those institutions and, and partner organizations which work um, in that area and which help often the IPLCCs and work together with them to make their case and to further build capacity, et cetera. So we try to bring that all together to reach out to all these constituencies and have a, and that's the small box in the middle, we um, are looking for a smaller group which is facilitating, managing and supporting that whole endeavor and where we will be looking for seven um, representatives for the seven IPLC regions and we will be looking for something like five plus minus um, relevant strategic partner organizations um, such as uh, the Equator Initiative representative, I mean it's just examples, or um, other institutions that work on, 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 on this in this field. 
And with this, I leave it to that, um, and I'm happy to respond to any further questions on this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, great presentation, and thank you for showing up that uh, uh, using indigenous people's traditional knowledge in IPBS is really very positive and helpful. So we're looking forward again. Uh, allow me now to introduce our uh, last but not least speakers here. Um, uh, Ms. Uh, Sekil, sorry, I'm not pronouncing well your name, uh, Koketsu from the uh, CBD Secretaria. And then, as you all know, CBDs really have been one of the good examples of uh, including indigenous peoples at the, UNF at the UN system. So you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, I actually bring you greetings from the Article, Article AJ team um, at the Secretariat of the CBD. Um, they are the ones who are overseeing this work on um, indigenous peoples and local communities. Um, so traditional knowledge under the CBD. Um, uh, the articles of the convention, Article 8J and related provisions, Article 10C, 17.2 and 18.4 of the convention address um, respect, preservation, maintenance, and promotion of knowledge, innovations, and practices of indigenous peoples and local communities, um, protecting and encouraging customary sustainable use um, of uh, bi a biological diversity, encouraging the exchange of information including indigenous and traditional knowledge, and also uh, methods for development and use of technologies, including indigenous and traditional technologies. Um, so these articles, as well as addressing specifically um, um, indigenous peoples and local communities, they are also cross-cutting under the other programs of work of the convention. Um, a fundamental principle of the program of work for Article AJ is the participation of IPLCs in the work of the CBD. So IPLCs are um, given space within the CBD um, through um, the negotiations and other um, activities of the CBD. The principal mechanism um, is through the ad hoc open-ended working group on Article AJ um, and the program of work for Article AJ and related provisions. So as Thomas highlighted, the next meeting of the working group on AJ will take place um, in December uh, 2017. Um, so under Article AJ, IPLCs um, participate in the work of the convention um, through the nomination of an indigenous co-chair to assist the party co uh, chairperson of the meeting um, appointment of seven representatives of IPLCs um, as an IPLC bureau that um, works with and informs the friends, um, sorry, the bureau uh, that's made up of parties. And then um, co chairs of um, contact groups and other meetings um, are selected from um, the IPLCs. And um, IPLCs are provided enhanced opportunities to make agenda, uh, interventions on all agenda items. So in um, Article 8J, but as well as in the subsidiary body on science, scientific, technical, and technological advice, and the subsidiary uh, body for implementation, um, IPLCs are given the opportunity to make their interventions immediately after parties and before observers. Um, and so this is how it looks. Um, the Secretariat of the CBD has um, focal points um, on traditional knowledge and customary sustainable use. And they are the, um, how do we, the liaison um, between um, the work of the convention and the International Indigenous Forum on Bi Biodiversity, um, which is uh, the one that um, uh, coordinates the work of the IPLCs under the CBD. Um, so the work of the CBD is also um, presented under the traditional knowledge information portal. Um, as I mentioned already, the ad hoc open-ended working group on Article AJ. Um, 
in in this in CBD meetings, IPLCs have their own separate designation, so they register as IPLCs. And like I mentioned before, then that gives them some uh, enhanced opportunities to participate in the CBD processes. Um, there's a specific voluntary funding mechanism um, for, for participation of indigenous peoples and local communities in the meetings of Article AJ, but also in meetings of the uh, subsidiary bodies and also for the convention. And then there are also capacity, build, capacity building and development programs that are funded um, through, the, through the work of the Secretariat. Um, so under Article AJ, um, there have been some um, huge successes. Um, so there's been a composite report on the status and trends of traditional knowledge. Um, there are guidelines for the conduct of cultural, environmental, and social impact assessment. Um, there's a code of ethical conduct to ensure the respect for the cultural and intellectual heritage of indigenous and local communities. There's a global plan of action on cu customary sustainable use of biological diversity and um, voluntary guidelines for the use of traditional knowledge, which include development mechanisms, legislation um, to ensure prior and inform informed consent, free prior and in informed consent, and or approval and involvement um, of indigenous peoples and local communities. Um, so under work that's undergoing right now is uh, development of voluntary guidelines for the repatriation of traditional knowledge and a glossary of relevant key terms and concepts to be used within the um, context of Article AJ. So in conclusion, um, the participation of indigenous peoples and local communities in the meetings of the convention, in particular working group on AJ, has contributed significantly to the adoption of decisions and guidelines by parties for the implementation of the CBD. Um, also in the post, uh, in the arrangements for the post-2020 strategy for the CBD, uh, IPLCs will be uh, uh, represented, they will have enhanced participation um, opportunities as well. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Sekilda. I think that was a, a, a very valuable presentation and very useful uh, for uh, discussions ongoing here and the um, climate change um, uh, discussions. Um, right now, I'd like to um, open up this space for a discussion. We hope to make this a conversation. So if people have questions, comments, please feel free. I see one hand up there, sir. Is there anyone with a microphone? and? And Dain, okay, I see, and Kimarin, okay. Well, I'm gonna try and note everyone. So we'll take the three questions first, and then um, and then we'll uh, have a round of responses. Good afternoon, Emilio Godoy, journalist from Mexico. Um, I got one question for the table. Um, how are you coping with traditional knowledge piracy, which is a very serious issue according to the available uh, latest uh, statistics. Thank you. And then uh, Handain? Merci, bonjour. <coughs> Donc, euh, j'ai deux questions. La première concerne euh, le monsieur honorable. Il a parlé de la médecine traditionnelle. C'est un, un, un sujet très, très important. Euh, concerne également les savoirs traditionnels qui sont en train de se perdre chaque jour, chaque jour, on perd des savoirs traditionnels. C'est la raison pour laquelle les peuples autochtones demandent euh, de débloquer un fonds urgent pour, la pour répertorier les savoirs traditionnels et la, la médecine traditionnelle. 
Je sais que euh, quelques pays africains ont déjà répertorié quelques euh, médecines, quelques aspects de la médecine euh, traditionnelle, mais l'Inde est le modèle mondial de cette, cette, cette action de répertorier la médecine traditionnelle. C'est très important, c'est très important. Il faut qu'on qu pense à la euh, qu'on pense à ce sujet qui est très important. Euh, deuxième, euh, c'est pas une question, c'est remarque. Euh, la CBD euh, constitue un, un modèle de euh, intégration des peuples autochtones dans les documents. Donc, euh, je vous donne un, un exemple. Le Maroc est le premier, je pense, le, le premier, mais parmi les pays qui ont traduit quelques documents euh, en langue autochtone euh, en faisant, euh, en faisant euh, un suivi euh, favorable à l'appel du secrétariat de la CBD. Donc, on a traduit euh, plusieurs documents euh, en tamazirte, en langue autochtone, mais grâce à la GIZ, le monsieur Gaillot, il est euh, à côté de moi, c'est la GIZ qui nous a idée à traduire plusieurs documents de la CBD. Le protocole de Nagoya a été traduit en langue amazir. Les objectifs d'Aichi ont été également traduits. C'est un travail énorme qui, qui, nous a, qui a donné des fruits, qui a donné des, des résultats énormes au sein de, de la population autochtone. Donc, merci beaucoup pour vos, votre intervention. Merci. Thank you very much, uh, the panelists, for very excellent and insightful presentations. Um, the situation we are in now, we've moved from a struggle to recognize indigenous and traditional knowledge to a very interesting space of recognition of uh, indigenous and traditional knowledge in text, both, for example, within the UNFCC and the CBD uh, frameworks including the creation of an indigenous and local communities platform for sharing these knowledges. And my question is really to the panelists, what do you see as your role in this local and indigenous people platform, and specifically to the IPFCC, from its design, its uh, scientific knowledge platform? And we are grateful that in the last uh, assessment report number five, there was a paragraph on traditional knowledge. But what is the probability, the possibility, maybe you're already doing, that you'll have indigenous and traditional knowledge holders being part of the team that drafts this because we have lenses through which we see knowledge. And therefore, it would be useful that indigenous knowledge uh, holders are part of this. We have heard the IP base is already trying to do that. So what is your role in making the local and indigenous people platform have life and meaning to inform climate change actions. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Kimaren. Um, uh, just a quick note, uh, uh, Mr. Felipe Lucio of the WMO will have to leave very shortly. So I'm just gonna look around the room and see if anybody has very specific questions to uh, uh, WMO and uh, Global Framework on Climate Services. Um, and if not, maybe I, I'd like to invite him uh, first uh, to, to maybe give some uh, initial comments or advice or recommendations to what's going on in the UNFCC, as you please. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I think uh, there's still a lot of work that is needed, and um, I, I welcome and, and commend the different initiatives that are promoting and trying to um, advance not only the use of um, traditional knowledge, but the integration of the two so that they, they are seamless, if you wish, and um, they're not seen as um, conflicting. But on the other hand, um, there are a couple of elements uh, uh, of the indigenous knowledge which perhaps uh, would need, um, as somebody said, uh, documenting, um, clarification, 
and that's where I think uh, uh, the need is still is still needed. Uh, the question is, um, how do we formulate uh, the questions that should be addressed as part of this effort of promoting um, 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 indigenous knowledge, and who gets involved in those processes? The concept of uh, bottom-up um, approaches are, are, are very useful. But on the other hand, we also need to see the different stakeholders who are interested in indigenous knowledge and how could they be brought to be part of um, the discussion and eventually of the way forward. So I'll leave you there. I have an engagement which started at uh, quarter past, so wish you uh, a good event. Um, okay, so we have um, three questions that uh, came up. Uh, um, one was on the piracy, and uh, one was on. Um, okay, now now I kind of forgotten the questions. Now. <laughs> but maybe I can, uh, Doug. Maybe you can start off. Yes, thank you. I'll, I'll address the first question that, that was uh, raised in relation to the issue of piracy, which is a. Uh, a major concern in, indeed when it comes to uh, uh, the knowledge of indigenous peoples. Uh, I think what needs to be considered there is that uh, there have been um, ongoing discussions in, re in relation to the intellectual property, intellectual property rights of indigenous peoples in the framework of both the CBD on access and benefit sharing, but also with WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization. And those are discussions that uh, continue um, <clears throat> but um, perhaps what is important to understand is that uh, uh, indigenous knowledge is a very large and very complex body of uh, information that uh, held by indigenous communities. And I think what is important to underline is the, the, the wise judgment of indigenous peoples themselves into what of that complex body of knowledge is, can be shared. Uh, can be usefully shared, for example, in relation to issues like, as we are discussing here, uh, climate change uh, observations, observations about the impacts of climate change on indigenous uh, livelihoods, for example. This might be information that uh, indigenous communities might be feel very motivated to share, uh, to uh, uh, inform the global community of the challenges that uh, they are facing. Uh, on the other hand, there may be other knowledge relating to uh, weather forecasting, which is uh, sacred uh, knowledge, uh, secret knowledge that is passed on uh, perhaps only from generation to generation within a, a lineage. So I think what's important is to realize first the complexity of the, and the breadth of indigenous knowledge, but also uh, the important role that indigenous peoples themselves would play in deciding what of that knowledge uh, is, uh, can be shared, can be discussed, uh, uh, in different fora and what of knowledge should be uh, held back and which is uh, considered by the community uh, to be um, sacred or uh, secret knowledge. And uh, in our own processes, uh, working with communities, that uh, is something that is made clear from the be beginning in terms of providing, uh, having free prior informed consent of the uh, indigenous people participating in dialogue workshops and the global workshops that they decide themselves what knowledge uh, should be shared, can be usefully uh, uh, engage uh, with the scientific community to uh, uh, build uh, knowledge, find solutions jointly, and what knowledge uh, is better or do they uh, wish to uh, hold back and keep to themselves. So I think that's a very important um, element that needs to be, or dimension that needs to be taken into consideration in any of the other the assessments or the uh, uh, work on climate change observation or adaptation. Thank you. The second question was uh, addressed to Yuba. C'était la question de Handen. J'espère que vous l'avez noté. Merci. I think il yeah, y, y, y a deux questions. Il y a le dernier également qui est sur la IPCC. Bah, je vais essayer. Pour la, la première question, bah, il me semble que eh, c'est d'une importance capitale de pouvoir euh, répertorier et puis capitaliser l'ensemble de ces euh, connaissances traditionnelles et la médecine traditionnelle. Euh, je pense que dans son intervention, Johnson Spensley a indiqué qu'il y a une fenêtre 
Euh, pour euh, les organisations euh, traditionnelles et puis euh, un, euh, indigènes euh, dans le cadre du Fonds vert pour le climat. Euh, il, il aura lieu de l'articuler euh, sur euh, les, la mise en œuvre ou, euh, de, de, de l'objectif de développement durable ou de l'articuler également sur un certain nombre de programmes au niveau national sur l'adaptation. C'est-à-dire qu'il ne faut pas le prendre de manière isolée. C'est fondamentalement lié à cela. Il faut le mettre dans un cadre beaucoup plus eh, global et, et avoir une connaissance également de la manière dont ces financements sont définis. Et il me semble que ce serait euh, certainement, vous allez trouver des moyens pour pouvoir euh, faire ce travail qui est essentiel, surtout qui est beaucoup plus facile à l'heure actuelle avec les nouvelles technologies de communication. On peut le faire assez facilement. For the second question, and I think that there is a, a wider way uh, to integrate uh, all those groups in the IPCC assessment process. I did not go for the assessment process. And then, first of all, and I indicated it during my, many of my talks, uh, all form association groups, organizations could be observed of IPCC. If you are observer organization in IPCC, you will take part to the scoping. And then the scoping will define uh, which issues will be addressed by the report. And then being part of that, and then the scoping is, uh, you will be part of the scoping. You can bring the perspective in the scoping. And then from the scoping, the outline of the report is adopted, and you will be part also the other adoption. More importantly, you can nominate authors And then if there is some authors who are sensitive to those issues, who are knowledgeable on those issues, they could be part of the process. And more importantly than that, you have the opportunity to come and report. You know, in some of the chapters, we receive 3,000 comments. And then if you say that, oh, this report, you are supposed to address that issue. This is a fundamental question you missed to address it. And then the author has to document why they have not addressed it. And then they will respond. And then there is different ways of taking part. First of all, if you go to IPCC website, it's similar to, I think, that IPBES learn from IPCC in the scoping, on the author selection, on the comments, and then on the review. And then you have different possibility and different perspective to do that. And it's very important that the community get together or link with a number of research communities and then to produce a new knowledge on those different issues. And then it's an early stage because the six assessment report of IPCC is just about to start. And then if you produce a new knowledge on those different issues, published in the few review literature, it will be incorporated even if you are not part of the process. And those are some of the, uh, just bring a short answer to your concern. This is really taken care. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yobu. And I'm going to attempt to remember Kamaran's question, and Kamaran can very much tell me if I'm going off track here. But I think it was to do with, um, as we move from this um, um, recognizing indigenous knowledge, then how do you create the space for indigenous peoples to actually participate in the promotion, advocacy, and protection of their own knowledge? Um, uh, maybe I'd like to um, look at the, my colleagues to my left here, uh, maybe just to say maybe a few words on that, and then we'll do uh, the final question from Hindu, and we'll close unless there are any f burning questions from the audience, especially from women. Only men <laughs> asked questions. <laughs> Looking around. Okay. Um, but maybe just, um, I mean, Thomas talked a little bit about this, but maybe you could just maybe say one or two key points about um, 
the space for indigenous knowledge holders and within the context of the policy. And I think that um, Sakil already at the CBD made this great strides in this. Um, I just, before I, I, I hand it over to Thomas, I just wanted to say we were supposed to have um, Jan here from FAO, but he couldn't make it. And I was kind of hoping that he would also give us some uh, points to share, but that, that didn't work out <laughs> either. Um, but um, uh, he sends his best regards and, and apologizes for not being here. Uh, FAO, as f all of you know, has also been very active in, in, in trying to engage with indigenous peoples within its process. So over to you, Thomas. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I think I indicated early on that, that the question of representation and, and whom and at what level to involve in these processes is a tricky one. I mean, it's a very important one, but I know, I mean, of that's very clear um, because it's important also to the other questions like who has actually the right to define the, the questions that will be then be answered and that is all about you know shaping the discourse and, and, and the scope. Um, so it is very important. It's also tricky because um, on the one hand you know these institutions are built modeled on you know on scientific endeavors in principle um, and it's a, it's a highly um, technical discussions often just the way how things are being brought together and based on the way we do things or you know have been learned from IPCC to do things etc so um, while on the one hand is this incredibly important to bring um, as indigenous and local communities and people holding that knowledge to the process at the same time they need to have a certain um, capacity to be be able to participate in such environments, um, often in, you know, with the scientific debates over creating or drafting a, 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 an assessment report, such the one on IPCC or NIPIS. And that is um, often a bottleneck, but there are people out there that, you know, they are, I mean, look at uh, my, my right side here. I mean, Jennifer is a distinguished scientist, and so is Doug, and, and, and both of them have both feet down on the ground in terms of um, indigenous uh, community work so, and, and come from indigenous people. So that is not a, not a reason um, to exclude, but it is for hope. There are um, fantastic capacities out there which, which straddle these or, or tap into all of these different um, pools. The other question, though, then is also um, because these these processes, I mean, the expert groups are, are somewhat limited. It's an exclusive process. You know, there's a selection of things, but then you need a lot more engagement to bring on other type of knowledge. Um, and this is where I think it becomes interesting to see how the process that, you know, established at the, the, the NFCCC or to be operationalized reaches out to other strategic partner institutions <coughs> to help them, you know, snowball that effect. Um, to really help them and, and carry that into the regions, into the, on, on the local um, scales and levels, um, and to generate that so they bring back what they need to bring back. One, maybe one point I would like to make before leaving is, 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 an, is another tricky or challenge, tr challenge, and that is indigenous is not always equal to local. And there's, we've, we've encountered quite significant um, struggles or challenges of how to do justice to these different type of knowledge. So indigenous, you know, what is, I mean, first of all, defining a definition of what is indigenous local, uh, indigenous knowledge and what is local knowledge is, is incredibly difficult. And even a vague um, working definition would be um, subject to a lot of discussion. Um, but then it's a question also, I mean, who's, you know, who is in what form organized to actually appear, you know, to be approachable for, um, you know, um, um, for efforts of IPIS or IPCC to engage that type of knowledge. And there you get into whole different com pr problems as well. But it is um, looking at our first um, experiences, for example, in the regional assessment has been one of the greater struggles in that as well that well you know it's a lot easier to identify indigenous uh, knowledge because they're very often um, better organized in, in many forms than just the general local knowledge and what that means you know for example in Eastern Europe or, or um, in, 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 in other areas which is not so well often often not so well organized as indigenous communities um, 
that is our, at least our experience, um, and I'm obviously seeing that only from a, a larger perspective. Maybe these are some of the points for discussion and take it further. Um, uh, Jason, would you like to have any um, contributions on further participation of uh, indigenous peoples in the Green Climate Fund before I hand it back to Hindu? Or I'd just say in, in summary that um, with the indigenous peoples policy coming out being finalized shortly together with uh, the guidance materials we we anticipate and welcome a m greater um, involvement and focus of, of funding proposals and, and programs on indigenous peoples based activities um, and um, and uh, looking for ways to uh, increase um, the 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 funding um, going directly to to indigenous peoples led led activities. Yep, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think time is uh, like about over, and then we are having the next site event. But I really would like you like to wrap up by one question that I'm going to put uh, to you. Like we are discussing the indigenous peoples knowledge platform here. Uh, from each of you, uh, what do you think will be relevant to help this platform to be operationalized? I mean, to get to get these decisions. And what in your work, I know from uh, uh, Green Climate Fund, CBD, and uh, IPBS, IPCC, and then uh, UNESCO. So you are always working with indigenous people. What are you going to do in your work to also help this to be achieved? So I'm going to start with uh, Jason, and then we continue. W one thing that would really benefit us all. Um, and, and, and benefit uh, addressing climate change uh, globally would, would be greater um, support and sharing of, 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 of mechanisms, of technologies, of approaches um, based on indigenous knowledge, ba uh, traditional practices, more systematic ways to share the good practices so that they can be used um, and continue to be used in the local communities but shared with other local communities across countries, across regions um, even. Um, a, we, 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 at the Green Climate Fund, we'd like to see more of that, so that there would be more systematic use of traditional approaches that, that, that we could fund, frankly. Um, but to do that, we need more sharing of the knowledge and of the technologies uh, across uh, geographies. Thank you. Thanks. So from the perspective of the CBD, um, I, I always say that uh, we have to remember that in the CBD, IPLCs are rights holders. And so um, I guess what could make the platform operationalized, uh, operational would be um, processes that would allow for enhanced participation of IPLCs, um, and not just as stakeholders, but as um, uh, specifically, I don't know, affected people um, and then um, obviously the uh, article AJ team is working very hard with the um, team here in UNF triple C um, helping them and providing them support um, maybe one thing from from our perspective in, in IP is I, I think is that I mean as someone else else mentioned We've just moved into a new space from you know, making the case that uh, indigenous and local knowledge is important in these arenas um, to actually thinking about, okay, how do we do it? How, how do we actually get on with this? Which is a really a, a new space. It's innovative and we have to really rethink a lot of ways how to do this. We are in this for this for the long term. It will take time to really get it right. We will not get it right from one day to another. Um, so one thing from our perspective was, uh, you know, a little bit the experience of, well, let's let's try to learn to walk before we run, and and work with the art. You know, it's a little bit the art of the feasible with what you have been given in your hands, <coughs> with an institution being set up, and then walk one step after another and learn from the different experiences and stuff. And one way of learning, but keeping the the path open is is just try not to shut any doors and but um nevertheless walk prudently in terms of institutional setup and, and considerations 
in short, to engage actively in IPCC because the door is open and then the platform could become observer organization. Yes, I think uh, two points I'd like to make. One is that uh, um, I think there is a need for institutional innovation. In other words, uh, simply saying that we continue more or less in the same modalities that we have currently uh, won't do the trick. And so there's certainly a need for more innovative thinking and more resources, in fact, uh, in order to really bring on board uh, indigenous peoples and the knowledge of indigenous peoples into these processes because it's so important. I think everyone recognizes what a major comp contribution can come from local communities, but major innovation is needed within the UNFCCC, within uh, uh, IPCC, within uh, uh, IPES, uh, within all of these global processes in order really to uh, move forward with this agenda. And uh, the second point is that, <coughs> which I picked up a bit from uh, uh, the previous panel, uh, Hindu was talking about the importance of ensuring the linkages from the global level to the local level. Uh, I don't think that, uh, that uh, we're going to make uh, much forward progress if uh, we're only discussing and taking action at the global level. So effective linkages from the local to the regional to the national and even sub-national level is the only way that uh, indigenous and local knowledge will effectively uh, become part of a process that will lead to climate change decision making at all of those scales, including then up to the global level. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Douglas. Thanks, thanks to everybody here on the panel, um, colleagues, um, for, for taking the time out from your busy schedule to come and participate in this event. And thank you for sharing your information with Indigenous peoples. And I hope uh, Indigenous peoples, our brothers and sisters, will, will take this opportunity to come and engage in all these spaces because it's, uh, we can only make the spaces better when we're there and active and present. Uh, thank you, Hindu, my, my, my wonderful co-facilitator, as always. Um, and so like now, I'd like to close the, the panel and uh, invite you to stay further for the next panel, um, which is um, co-organized by IFGIA, AIPP, and NEFIN on Indigenous Peoples' Rights and Addressing Implementation Gaps of the Paris Agreement Preamble through the Indigenous Peoples Platform. I hope I got the title right. Uh, thanks very much, everybody. Thank you.